Did you know that certain sections of the Bible are almost identical to stories from Mesopotamian religion written on pieces of clay a thousand years earlier? Today I'll be exploring the similarities between the Sumerian kings and the biblical lineage of Adam. I'll be looking at the Garden of Eden, the truth behind Easter, and shocking revelations that will change how you view religion. The Great Flood the Eridu Genesis was written on a clay tablet around 2300 BC. The tablet was found in the ancient city of Nippur in 1893. Upon this ancient surface is the first written version of a great flood decimating the world. The flood is described in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which I'll mention later on, but it's in the Eridu Genesis that the Bible got its inspiration for the story of Noah's Ark. So without further ado, let's dig in. The gods were trying to rest, but humans were being too noisy and annoying. The gods agreed that their creations were a flop, failed experiments that were now causing them too much irritation. The gods agreed it was time to pull the plug and flood the globe. I mean, what else could they have done? Besides, maybe ask the pesky humans to turn down the volume. The god Enlil learned of the plan and decided to betray his fellow gods. He liked the humans, even though they were a little noisy. But knowing he couldn't stop all the other gods on his own, he cooked up a sneaky plot. Enlil, or sometimes Enki, depending on the translation, visited a man named Ziasudra and told him of the incoming flood. Ziasudra agreed to build an ark which he could hold his family and some animals in. The flood came, but Ziasudra was perfectly safe aboard his boat. For seven days and seven nights, Ziasudra floated listlessly upon a sea that covered the earth. When the water receded, the gods felt ashamed of what they'd done. They had basically spanked their kids into oblivion and then felt guilty about it. But imagine their surprise when they saw Ziasudra floating on his little boat when the rest of humanity was being nibbled on by billions of fish. The gods were so happy that one human family survived that they gave them eternal life so that they might restart human civilization. The story of Noah and Ziasudra are similar, but not totally the same. In Noah's story, he was blessed by his god but wasn't made immortal. He was made semi-divine, which is almost as good. In the Bible, God enters a covenant with Noah. He promises never to destroy humanity again. Maybe it's that covenant that prevented us from being destroyed in the past few thousand years, even with all the terrible things that happened. On the other hand, the Mesopotamian gods made no such promise. The Sumerians believed they had to keep their gods happy or else they would flood the world again. Or in even simpler terms, the Sumerians were afraid of another watery spanking by their irritable deities. The Ancient Ones In the Bible, Adam was the first man created by God. In Sumer, Alulim was the first Sumerian king of Eridu. Both of them lived ridiculously long lives, as did their offspring. The connection between the lineage of Adam and the long lives of the early Sumerian kings is uncanny. These connections are going to shock and astound you, but it's a complex subject, so let's take it one step at a time, starting with the Bible. The generations of Adam could be compared to vampires based on how long they lived, but after several thousand years, the descendants of Adam started dying a lot faster. Adam lived for 930 years. 12,500 years later, Moses only lived to be 120. There were approximately 26 patriarchs between Adam and Moses. The man who lived the longest was Methuselah. He was the eighth patriarch and boasted an incredible lifespan of 969 years. After him came Lamech, who lived 770 years. Then there was Noah, everyone's favorite boat builder. He lived for an impressive 950 years. There are a few important points I need to make. The first involves Enoch, the father of Methuselah. Out of the ten patriarchs prior to the biblical flood, Enoch was the only one who didn't live to be around 900 years old. Enoch only lived to be 365, and only because the Bible says he was taken into heaven by God while he was still alive. Or maybe he was taken back to the mothership, nobody knows for sure. After the flood, things changed dramatically. The average age dropped from roughly 900 to only 600 with Shem, Noah's son. Then things dropped again with Arpashad, who only lived to be 438. The flood caused a rapid drop in life expectancy that the Bible never explained. Now let's take a look at the Sumerian king list. This ancient document was discovered in Mesopotamia with the names of all the earliest kings of Sumer 
and their reigns inscribed upon it. The king list is a little different from the Bible. Instead of ten patriarchs before the flood, the king list only mentions eight. The first man and the survivor of the flood are missing from the king list. But if you add the Sumerian versions of Adam and Noah, the two lists have the same number of early patriarchs. Another difference is that the Sumerian kings lived for way longer than just 900 years. The earlier Sumerian kings lived on average for 30,000 years. Just like in the Bible, the life expectancy plummeted after the flood. And yes, the exact same flood appears in the Bible and Sumerian texts. After almost all of humanity was obliterated by the angry waters of the gods, kings stopped living long lives. By the days of Moses, kings had begun to live only a mere century. The similarities here are shocking, just like I said they would be. Many scholars believe the Bible copied the idea of long-living patriarchs from earlier Sumerian texts. Other more fringe researchers believe that the Bible and the Sumerian texts were talking about the same people. Well, not exactly people. One hypothesis is that the early kings and patriarchs were humanoid space aliens. They came from the stars to take control of humanity. And yes, they lived for hundreds or thousands of years. But as the mysterious beings became accustomed to Earth and human life, they lost their ability to live for eons. There's one more thing to mention before diving into the truth of the Garden of Eden. The characters are nearly identical. In the Bible, Enoch is the seventh patriarch who ascended to heaven after 350 years. And in the Sumerian king list, Emma Durana was the seventh king whose advisor ascended to heaven. And now for number nine, but first it's shout out time. I wanted to give a big thank you to Tammy Ashton and Michael Montgomery for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these. Eridu and the Garden of Eden. The Sumerian king list says that when the kingship descended from heaven, they ruled the city of Eridu. Mesopotamian myths marks Eridu as the first city to be ruled by kings. But get this, it's not a myth. Eridu is a real place. In southeastern Mesopotamia is the ruin of the earliest known city in the world. People were living in Eridu 7,000 years ago. The Bible also mentions the first city, though not in such a direct way. The book of Genesis says that after man was created, he lived in the Garden of Eden. Not exactly a city, but still the first place where humans lived. Based on the Bible's description of where the Garden of Eden was located, scholars think it was near the city of Eridu. It's yet another coincidence tying the king list to the Bible. The book of Genesis proceeds to say that after Cain murdered his brother Abel, Cain was banished eastward from Eden to dwell in the land of Nod. Cain met his wife there, who bore him a son named Enoch. Cain also built a city and named it after his son. This, according to the Bible, was the first real city in the world. A city named Enoch, which sounds pretty close to Eridu. Then again, Eridu sounds even closer to Arad, the name of Enoch's son. It could be that Enoch built the first city, not Cain. The Bible has been misinterpreted. Plus, Eridu was the city of the god Enki in Sumerian myth. Enki and Enoch are nearly the same name. The names are a weird coincidence, and so is the timeline. It's hard to dispute the fact that Eridu was the first city in both the Bible and Mesopotamian myth. There's even physical evidence of it. I'm talking about the same place and the same story, just with slightly different names. Easter and the Resurrection Why did humans create religion? It seems like an impossible question to answer, but it really isn't. Most scholars agree that religion was created at the dawn of civilization to worship the sun. Humans in the Stone Age understood that the sun was the giver of life. The sun brought energy to grow crops, and when the sun was gone, it was cold and there was no food to eat. An obsession with the sun likely began when the Neanderthals still walked the earth. As time went on, civilizations came up with different stories and myths to explain their reverence of the sun. Thus came the story of Easter and the tale of the resurrection. The story of Jesus Christ has been told since humans could speak, and Easter has been celebrated since the first crop was put in the ground. It's just that the stories came in different forms. Jesus wasn't always Jesus, and Easter wasn't always called Easter. In Mesopotamia, Easter existed long before the cult of Jesus Christ arose in the Roman Empire. If you don't believe me, you're going to in about two minutes. I'll start my argument by giving you the names of gods who were created as personifications of the sun. The first is the most obvious, Ra, a central deity in ancient Egypt. He had the body of a man, 
and the head of a falcon with the sun literally sitting on his head. In ancient Egyptian iconography, the sun above Ra's head was one of the earliest forms of the halo. The halo was surrounded by a serpent, yet another creature that appears throughout so many ancient religions. One of the most important Norse goddesses was Sol, the beautiful personification of the sun. Her twin brother was Mani, the god of the moon. In Greece, Helios was the sun god. He was so important that the Colossus of Rhodes was made in his image. The great bronze statue of Helios guarded the harbor of Rhodes as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world until an earthquake toppled it. The Aztec worshipped the sun god Huitzilopochtli. The Hindu sun god is Surya. The Inca had Inti. The Maya had Kinichahor. And the Celts had Luch. I could go on all day, and you might want me to, but I have a lot more to tell you in this video. Come back again soon for a deeper dive into the great sun gods of the world. Now let me give you the scoop on Easter. Did you know that the word Easter is a ripoff of the Anglo-Saxon fertility goddess Istra? A letter written by Pope Gregory I proves that the church stole the name. In the letter, Gregory said it would be easier to convert Anglo-Saxons to Christianity by reusing the names of their heathen gods. Modern Easter is a mix between the festival of Istra and the pre-Christian celebration of Lent, which was essentially a spring party. In addition, modern Easter includes a touch of the crucifixion and the traditional sin-shaming. The reason you stuff your face with delicious chocolate eggs every year is that the rabbit is an ancient symbol of fertility, and so are eggs. Haven't you ever thought it's weird that Easter is all about eggs and rabbits when rabbits don't lay eggs? The Mesopotamian connection can be found in the myth of Inanna. She was the Sumerian goddess of fertility and also the personification of Venus. She was the queen of heaven, an important deity in the Sumerian pantheon. Her origin story is going to sound extremely familiar. Inanna goes on a journey into the underworld, which is controlled by her sister Ereshkigal. There's some family drama, and then Inanna is captured. She's judged, murdered, and then hung on display for all to see. She wasn't crucified, but she was strung up like a martyr. Days later, Inanna is resurrected and goes back to the surface. These tales are ancient, spanning generations, and all focus on the cycle of seasons. They begin with the sun's decline, reaching its shortest day on December 23rd. But just three days later, the sun rises again, signaling the start of longer days. Both Jesus and Anana's resurrections are symbols of this seasonal shift. It's all good news, though. Without these stories, there would be no Christmas, no holiday vacation, and no homemade banana bread. The Disputations the Sumerian disputations were a major part of Mesopotamian religion. It was written by the Sumerians as a series of short stories around the middle of the 3rd millennium BC. The book contains seven major debates, but could have had more. Scientists have only found and translated seven. The debates are fascinating because they are extremely similar to various proverbs in the Bible. The disputations represent philosophy at its finest, thousands of years before Aristotle or Plato ever sat down to write their thoughts. The seven debate topics include debate between sheep and grain, debate between bird and fish, and the dispute between silver and copper, but the list goes on. For comparison, I would like to focus on the debate between winter and summer. The story is told in the form of a poem. Archaeologists used to believe the poem was a conversation between a pair of vegetation gods known as Amesh and Enten. But now it's accepted that the debate is really between summer and winter as actual seasons. Here's where you're going to start noticing similarities. The two seasons are personified as brothers in this story. They're born when the god Enlil gets a little frisky with a hill. Yep, an inanimate hill. The hill then gives birth to summer and winter, and Enlil decides what their fate shall be. The brother Summer is destined to establish large towns and villages, send laborers out to farm the land, and collect a beautiful harvest. The brother Winter is destined to bring spring floods, place grain in the fields, and do a lot of gathering. After the brothers have had some time with their destinies, they decide that they'll take their gifts to Enlil. If it hasn't clicked yet, this story is extremely similar to the tale of Cain and Dable, the two brothers who also presented gifts to their god. Summer and Winter start to argue about who has the better gift. Summer berates Winter for being annoying and making people cold. Winter retorts that he has control of irrigation and that Summer's harvest couldn't exist without him. During the debate, Enlil arrives and declares that Winter has the better gifts. Unlike the story of Cain and Abel, 
This one has a happy ending. Summer and winter make up and agree that they are both useful. In the Bible, Cain is filled with horrible jealousy that Abel's gift is better, so he murders his brother. It was, suffice to say, an enormous overreaction. Genesis versus Genesis The Sumerian civilization had their own version of the Genesis myth from the Bible. That's to say they had their own view of how the world was created. But it wasn't all that different from the current Christian view that God made the world in seven days. 3,500 years before the first written form of the Bible, the people of Mesopotamia came up with interesting ideas to explain the creation of the universe. They didn't have one singular book of cosmic truth like the Christians do now. They had a lot, but not many of them are still around. Most literature from ancient Mesopotamia exists only in fragmented clay tablets. They've only been partially analyzed, and there are still a lot of missing pieces. But still, the Epic of Gilgamesh can tell us a lot. The Epic of Gilgamesh is an epic story about a hero who embarked upon a quest for eternal life. It's one of the earliest literary texts in the world, and what I find so amazing about it is that the story proves humans have been telling epic tales of heroes and villains since they learned how to write. Within the story is an explanation for the creation of the universe. The book says that before the gods there was nothing. An empty void like the infinite space behind your closed eyelids. Then came the gods An and Enlil, who separated the heavens and earth to create the mortal realm. This isn't the same story as God creating everything in six days and then having a bit of a snooze on the seventh, but it does reinforce the myth that before the creation of heaven and earth, there was nothing. It's reminiscent of the Big Bang Theory, which says nothing at all existed before the universe was suddenly born. The Egyptian Connection You have heard all about the similarities between Mesopotamia and the Bible today, but what about ancient Egypt? We wouldn't want Egypt sitting on the sidelines feeling left out, when in reality much of the Bible was copied from old Egyptian texts. The Ecclesiastes and Proverbs are the biggest perpetrators of Egyptian plagiarism. The books were supposedly written by King Solomon himself. Solomon delved deep into philosophies and contemplated the meaning of life and his own existence. During his contemplations, King Solomon had revelation after revelation, and he wrote down everything in books that would be incorporated into the Hebrew Bible. His final revelation, detailed in the last chapter of Ecclesiastes, is that young people should enjoy their lives. That's a good message, right? It would be if I stopped right now, but Solomon got kind of bleak later on. He wrote about how human ability diminishes as they age until there's nothing left but an old, wrinkly animal. He paints a vivid image in Ecclesiastes, if he really was the author of the book. But the base message for young people to enjoy life while they're young is still sound to this day. Now take a look at the Pris Papyrus, written around 2400 BC in Egypt. A small fraction of this ancient document is stashed at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. The text is said to be a teaching of Tahotep. He was like the Jafar to Pharaoh Jedker of the 5th dynasty, but probably a little less evil and without a genie and a talking parrot. Much like King Solomon, Tahotep was interested in philosophy and human existence. He wrote similar lamentations as in Ecclesiastes, talking about how humans decline and young people should have fun. There are dozens of examples just like this. What I want to do now is something a little different. I'm going to compare ancient Egyptian texts to excerpts from various biblical books, and I want you to pay close attention to the similarities. Divine plans are one thing, human desires are another. In their hearts, human beings plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. The first line comes from the teachings of Anksha Shank, written in the 4th century BC. The second line is from Proverbs. The car souls of all the living were created in the image of Ptah, all formed in his heart and by his tongue. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. The first line is from the hymn to Ptah, written in the 19th dynasty. The second line is from the book of Genesis, Another line in the hymn to Ptah is, Having done all these things, Ptah rested and was content with his work. It's nearly identical to, God saw all that he made and it was very good, so on the seventh day he rested. This isn't talked about much, but almost all the important lines from the Bible can be found in significantly older papyrus documents from ancient Egypt. Forget about Mesopotamia for a second, the Bible is almost a carbon copy of old Egyptian books. 
How does that make you feel? The Anunnaki and the Nephilim. Your brain is likely overflowing with information right now from all these crazy comparisons. You might like to hear about something a little more familiar, such as the alien gods known as the Anunnaki and the giants of the Bible known as the Nephilim. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the gods who doom humanity to death by flooding are the Anunnaki. All the Mesopotamian gods I've talked about today can be considered part of the Anunnaki. The name itself comes from an old Sumerian term that means those of royal blood. Therefore, any Sumerian god can be considered an Anunnaki. In the book of Genesis, in which you find the biblical flood with Noah, there's mention of the Nephilim. They were also of royal blood, but not quite in the same way as the Anunnaki. The Bible says the Nephilim were the descendants of God's sons and the daughters of men, or in less confusing terms, angels and human women. Angelic human hybrids, if that makes you more comfortable. Considering all the parallels between the Epic of Gilgamesh and Genesis, it's safe to say that there's a connection between these two mythical beings. The Nephilim are almost definitely tied to the Anunnaki. But how? The Anunnaki and the Nephilim are likely different versions of the same creatures. There's a belief among scholars that the angels of Genesis were alien visitors. They came down from the stars and bred with humans, creating a race of half-breeds. Those same scholars have suggested that the Anunnaki were aliens who came down from the stars and bred with humans, creating a race of half-breeds. The angels and the Anunnaki are the same in this situation, just given different names. The only mystery is that the Nephilim don't appear in the Epic of Gilgamesh. It could be that Gilgamesh himself was a personification of the Nephilim, since he was described as a semi-divine being. Both Gilgamesh and the Nephilim were partly responsible for the world being flooded. The 33rd Parallel there's something weird going on with Parallel 33, the northern one. The 33rd parallel is an invisible line that circles the Earth's equator at approximately 33 degrees north. That's not to be confused with the southern 33rd parallel. The northern line cuts across some of the most mysterious places in the world, and nobody knows why. In the northern hemisphere, Parallel 33 cuts across Los Angeles, Phoenix, Dallas, and Roswell. Both John F. Kennedy and his brother Robert were assassinated on Parallel 33. An obscene number of UFO sightings have been made on the Parallel as well, like the Phoenix Lights and the Roswell Incident of 1947. The Casa Grande ruins in New Mexico also fall on Parallel 33. These ruins were left by a mysterious civilization in 1450 AD. You're probably thinking that this is all just a coincidence. After all, there are plenty of parallel lines that move across the globe, cutting it into little grid-sized pieces. But the 33rd parallel is special. It was on this parallel that Jesus Christ predicted his own death at Caesarea Philippi. It was also on this parallel that the Tigris and Euphrates rivers meet in old Mesopotamia, in modern-day Iraq. Jesus predicted his own death on this line, and Sumerian civilization was born on this line. Maybe there's nothing to it and it's just a coincidence, but I know that some of you out there don't believe in coincidences, so let me know what you think in the comments down below. Remus, Romulus, Moses, and Sargon According to the Book of Exodus, the nameless pharaoh was threatened by the growing population of Hebrews in Egypt. Talk about insecurity. The pharaoh commanded all the male Hebrew babies to be killed. It was an atrocity of biblical proportions, with mothers frantically trying to hide their babies from the ruthless Egyptians. One mother had the brilliant idea to put her newborn son in a waterproof basket made of bulrushes. Then she let him drift down the river. Consider yourself a biblical scholar if you know who this little baby was. That's right, he was Moses, the man who would grow to be the savior of the Hebrew people. But did you also know that Moses had a sister named Miriam? Miriam watched the basket as it floated peacefully down the river and bumped up against a beautiful woman bathing. That beautiful woman was the daughter of the evil Pharaoh. This was all part of God's plan to put Moses under the protection of the Pharaoh. Floating a baby down the river is a tale as old as time. It might be weird, but it's everywhere in ancient cultures. There are dozens of stories just like it, featured in the myths of Canaan, Greece, India, Rome, and Mesopotamia. 
In Mesopotamia, the little baby is named Sargon. He was the ruler of the Akkadian Empire in 2000 BC, centuries before the story of Moses was ever told. Just like Moses, Sargon was put into a basket by his mother and was sent adrift down a river. Only his mother was a high priestess and Sargon was an illegitimate baby. He was rescued by a gardener named Aki and soon came under the watchful eye of the goddess Ishtar. Ishtar helped Sargon grow into a great warrior, setting him on the throne to become the future emperor. Sargon's story isn't identical to the myth of Moses, but it's similar enough to make you wonder. This is normally where one topic ends and another begins, but I want to tell you about more babies in baskets. According to Roman mythology, Romulus and Remus were the sons of Princess Rhea Silvia and Mars, the god of war. They were demigods, just like Hercules in Greek myth. And because of their divine status, the local ruler where they were born wanted them gone. Like all the insecure kings afraid of tiny babies, the ruler feared that the boys would steal his throne. So he put the babies in a basket and set them floating down the Tiber River, assuming they would die. The boys weren't discovered by a bathing princess or a helpful gardener. Instead, Remus and Romulus were discovered by a she-wolf. They were raised to be fearsome beasts in the wild. However, they were later rescued by a shepherd. The boys grew up and overthrew the king. Then they founded Rome. Well, not both of them. Romulus killed Remus in a fit of anger and then founded Rome by himself on April 21st, 753 BC. That's why the city is called Rome and not Reem, or whatever it might have been if Remus hadn't died. The Tower of Babel. What's the most famous tower ever built? Is it the Tower of Pisa? Maybe the Sears Tower? Or the Tower of Jericho? Or how about the Tower of Babel? If you answer D, you're right on the money. In the book of Genesis chapter 11 verse 1 through 9, a story is told about a fantastic tower that's so tall it threatened to scratch the heavens. It was the first skyscraper ever constructed, but God wasn't particularly happy about it. What followed the completion of the tower was one of the more aggressive things God did in the Bible. Chronologically, this story takes us to the first few decades after the flood. The few people who remained after the flood were said to be descendants of one man and his family, which is pretty gross if you think about it. And they all spoke a single language. It makes sense to speak one language, given there was, biblically speaking, only one group of humans. Humans had recovered and were growing numerous by this time and had migrated into the land known as Shinar. Shinar is also called Babylonia. In this Mesopotamian land, they decided to build a tower as evidence of their magnificence. Here's something a lot of people who haven't read the Bible don't understand. Many of its stories take place in Mesopotamia. Babylon was a huge part of the Hebrew Bible because it was a huge part of the world. And so after the flood, but still hundreds of years before Moses and the Exodus, the people of God found themselves in Babylon building a tower. God looked down, crossed his arms, shook his head and said, no way. God was displeased with the pride and ambition of the builders. He broke their tower into pieces and then shattered their language. God then scattered his people from Babylon to all the corners of the earth, resulting in the creation of thousands of cultures and thousands of languages. This is how the Bible explains how humans dispersed after the flood. The place where the tower originally stood became known as Babel, which means confusion. It makes sense because, holy moly, it must have been quite disorienting to be suddenly teleported from Babylon to the Amazon. Long before the story of Babel was written down, the Sumerians of Mesopotamia told a similar story. It was called Emakar and the Lord of Arata. In the tale, the god Enki notoriously multiplies human languages. Assyrian expert Samuel Noah Kramer was the man who interpreted the old story and labeled it the Sumerian version of the Babel myth. Unfortunately, though, the story is fragmented and incomplete. There's no mention of a tower or of why Enki multiplied human language. But even still, the few passages make it clear that the Sumerians already had a story about hubris and the scattering of languages long before the Tower of Babel. As a side note, the Tower of Babel was likely a real structure. Whether you believe in the Bible or not, archaeology doesn't lie. Not usually, anyway. 
Researchers think the Tower of Babel was a ziggurat in the city of Babylon. It was likely built around 2200 BC. The Babylonians were notorious for building huge ziggurat pyramids that touched the heavens. The earliest ones were made around 5,000 years ago. Some have suggested that the ziggurat of Ur was the inspiration behind the Tower of Babel. That would be pretty amazing, seeing as the ziggurat of Ur is still standing near Baghdad right now. It was even built around 2200 BC, lining it up perfectly with what the Bible says. Did finding out that the Bible is based on older texts change your view of some religions? Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.